Republicans pointing to Paris say President Obama can't close Gitmo, and they won't let him. This is Special Report. Good evening, I'm Brett Baer. President Obama enters his last two years in office with a new Congress, but the old problem of Islamic extremism and how he handles terrorists in Iraq, in Yemen, and in Gitmo could define his legacy. This is we learn more about the terrorist whose attacks in Paris drew worldwide outrage and a record crowd to the streets. We have Fox Team coverage tonight. John Huddy looks at the flight of Jews from Europe. Rick Leventhal has the latest on the investigation from Paris. But we begin with Chief White House correspondent Ed Henry, who's live at the White House with what the president's doing to fight terrorism. Good evening, Ed. Good evening, Brett. Today, the president's spokesman claimed it's inaccurate to say that radical Islam is to blame for the Paris attacks. In their first face-to-face -face since Republicans took over Congress, President Obama again pledged to work with the GOP. I'm very much looking forward to uh, not just this discussion, but uh, uh, some real collaboration. Though a few minutes later, Press Secretary Josh Earnest left the door open to going around Congress again. When asked if he's willing to admit the president cannot shut down the U.S. military prison at Guantanamo by executive action. Well, I, I, um, I'm not willing to jump that far ahead. The president uh, may be able to prevail upon enough members of Congress to work with him to achieve, again, a goal well, that is shared by Democrats it, and Republicans. It, 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 Except the new Republican chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Richard Burr, wants the opposite. Today, pushing legislation to halt all transfers of terrorists out of Gitmo, since most remaining detainees came from Yemen. And the Kawachi brothers, who led the terror attacks in Paris, had direct ties to Al-Qaeda in Yemen. We realize that anybody that might be at Guantanamo or anywhere in the world that has knowledge and texture of Yemen in 2011 is a legitimate source for us to go to and to run the names of the brothers and to see if there was talk of an operation. The fallout also continued over the White House's failure to send the president or another high official to Sunday's massive Paris rally against terror. And the criticism was coming from the president's usual allies. Couldn't Obama have at least sent a friend? Although former President Jimmy Carter tried to support Mr. Obama in a Yahoo News interview with a line of defense the White House probably did not need. I know that uh, President Obama's just come back from vacation. I know how it is when you've been gone for a week or two. Your desk is piled up and he had other pressing problems to address. Political reported White House officials are counting on Monday's admission of a mistake to lead reporters to get bored and move on, as aides again refused to discuss what the president was doing instead on Sunday. Did you get a chance to have a conversation with the president? Well, I, uh, there, was a, there were conversations here uh, at the White House uh, about that, but I don't have anything to, uh, well, to so share about it. Is the president upset that this decision that involved all these other world leaders, that it, it just never reached his desk? Has he expressed any anger about that? Mm -hmm. uh, not that I'm aware of. Joe Lieberman, the former Democratic vice presidential nominee, today blasted the administration's refusal to blame the Paris attacks on radical Islam. Sure, there's forms of extremism that threaten us, but the one we're at, at war with is violent Islamist extremism. That's the force that attacked America on 9-11. Ernest responded by saying it's inaccurate to use the phrase radical Islam because it does not describe our enemies. He said the terrorists in France tried to justify their actions by invoking Islam. Islam and using that phrase, calling it out as radical Islam, just legitimizes their warped view of the religion, Brett. Ed Henry, live on the North Lawn. Ed, thank you. We're learning more about the Charlie Hebdo attack, and new information suggests the terrorists involved had powerful friends. Senior correspondent Rick Leventhal has the latest from Paris. <laughs> Newly released amateur footage shows the Kuwachi brothers shortly after the attack on the Charlie Hebdo newspaper office calmly returning to their getaway car, yelling they'd avenged the prophet, swapping the magazines on their weapons before opening fire on police.
French authorities are racing to find out who supplied weapons and cash to the brothers and their associate, Ahmed Koulibaly, who killed a French policewoman Thursday and four others Friday at a kosher grocery. Police now say the weapons stockpile came from abroad and the financing was substantial. That, plus the logistics involved, indicates an organized terror network. Leaving a French court in 2008, the younger Kouachi brother, accused of trying to smuggle Islamist fighters to Iraq, claimed it was all a mistake. They were just kids from the suburbs. Another suspect linked to the terror cell appeared in a Bulgarian courtroom Tuesday. 29-year-old French citizen Fritz Jolie Joachet was detained trying to enter Turkey January 1st on old charges, but he's now facing extradition on a new warrant for his ties to the Kouachi brothers. Today, a memorial service was held at police headquarters in Paris for the three officers killed in last week's attacks. President Francois Hollande posthumously awarding them the Legion of Honor, placing the medals on their caskets, saying they died so we could live free. Meanwhile, the surviving staff of the Charlie Hebdo satirical newspaper is set to release this week's special edition, the first since the attack, featuring a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad on the cover with a tear in his eye, holding a Je Suis Charlie sign and the caption, All is Forgiven. The terrorists said it was another cartoon of Muhammad that inspired them to target the paper. The editors say this wasn't the front page the world wanted them to make, but it's the one they wanted to make. And today, in the midst of all of these terror concerns, the French government voted to extend airstrikes against ISIS in Iraq. The vote was 488 to 1. Brett? Rick Leventhal live in Paris. Rick, thanks. Now to correspondent John Huddy in Jerusalem, where some killed in the Paris attacks were laid to rest as European Jews worry for their safety. Their bodies were wrapped in a tali, a Jewish prayer shawl. Today, it was a burial sheet. Johan Cohen, Yoav Hatab, Philippe Abraham, and Francois Michel Sada, the four Jewish victims killed in the attack at the kosher grocery in Paris, were buried today in Jerusalem. Francois Sada's son, Jonathan, spoke about his father's love of Israel. He really like, he was in love of Israel. He really wanted to, to live here, and he will. Long plagued by violence, Israel is now being cast as a home for Jews amid the growing fear of terrorism and rise of anti-Semitism in Europe. France has Europe's largest Jewish community. Last year, more than 7,000 French Jews emigrated to Israel, the most since 1969, fueled by a bad economy. Jews who wish to come to Israel are welcome with open arms, with all our warmth. They will not come to a foreign land. They will come to their forefathers' ancestral home. But French officials are encouraging Jews to stay. Security has been increased outside Jewish schools like this one and in areas like Les Marais. It's one of Paris's main Jewish communities where delis line the streets next to restaurants, shops, and kosher markets like the one attacked Friday. Fear. Total 100% fear. Holly Panzer is a photographer who moved to France from Israel after the second Palestinian uprising in 2005. She feared death. Now, she says, the same fear is back. Suddenly, time stops, and you don't really understand what's going on. And I felt that panic in people here, for sure, for the first time since I've lived here in 13 years. Now, she says for the time being, she'll remain in Paris. Uh, there's an organization, it's called the Jewish Agency. It promotes immigration to Israel, and it estimates that even before the terror attacks, as many as 10,000 French Jews were considering moving to Israel this year, and now following the attacks, that number is likely to rise. Brett? John Huddy in our Mideast newsroom. John, thank you. A court ruling today may free toppled Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak. The corruption case was the last one keeping the 86-year-old in prison. He had already been cleared of charges. He killed protesters during the 2011 uprising that deposed him. Egyptian officials aren't saying when Mubarak would go free. Ukraine's shaky truce with Russia could be doomed. Russian-backed separatists destroyed the Donetsk airport in eastern Ukraine today. The air control tower was reduced to rubble. That incident and an attack on civilians drew a stern rebuke from the State Department.
Today's vicious and repeated attacks on the Donetsk airport and the shelling of a bus that killed 10 people and wounded 13 are just the latest egregious violations of the commitments made by the Russian-backed separatists. Both sides are trading accusations over which side caused the breakdown in the truce. Up next, three times the charm? A Republican insider tells us there's an 80% chance we'll see Mitt Romney throw his hat in the ring for 2016. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. WFLD in Chicago with the Illinois mom whose teenage son is accused of trying to join ISIS, who has a message for the group. Mohammed Hazma Khan's mother says the terrorists are brainwashing young people on social media, adding, quote, leave our children alone. KSTU in Salt Lake City with a story about a three-year-old boy who is safe after a suspect stole a car with the child inside this morning. The toddler's mom dropped off another child at daycare and left Aiden in the vehicle alone with a cell phone. After her car was stolen, she called her phone. The little boy answered, telling officers he was alone in the abandoned car. He helped police find him by honking the horn and was reunited with his mother 45 minutes later. And this is a live look at Miami. Sunset down there in Miami and our affiliate WSVN. The big story there tonight, eight Cuban migrants who made it to the Florida coast. They spent four days at sea having stocked up on fresh water and food. And under the wet foot, dry foot policy, they are now free to start their lives in the U.S. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back.